all you wonderful people. This is Ben Chuel, and today I'm looking at Britain in a contemporary modern sense. So I don't usually talk about modern Britain in any extensive sense, but you may have noticed that we kind of have a, a weird prime minister who goes around wearing a, a blonde wig and he's actually broken the law now and we've been kind of in disarray since 2016 and Brexit. So I just want to explain to you, to those of you who are not here, what's going on. A couple of my American friends have asked me, well, what is going on over there? Are you okay? Are you going to come back because things are crazy over there? Well, I'm going to explain that to you today. First of all, the political sense is nuts. So up in Scotland, we've got a Scottish National Party. They want independence, so they control Scotland. In Wales, here where I am, we have a kind of a, a socialist and nationalist semi-unofficial coalition, which isn't a coalition, but it is. And in England, which doesn't have its own parliament, but has a British parliament, which acts over the others, you have a conservative government, which isn't behaving like conservatives and have been funded by Russians. And over in Ireland and Northern Ireland, I don't actually know, and no one really knows what's going on in Northern Ireland because it's just a bit troubled, isn't it? So how did we get to this situation? And where are we going? What's caused it? Why are we in this situation? And at the moment you have the English parliament, well, there is no English Parliament. That's part of the problem. So how do we get to this point where each part of the United Kingdom is so pulling against each other? You only need to look at Brexit to understand that it is divided. The vote that happened a few years ago, and it was an English nationalist vote. That's, a, that's the only way to describe it, because Scotland and Northern Ireland voted overwhelmingly to remain. Wales, those people who were consider themselves to be Welsh in Wales, voted to remain. But the English in Wales voted to leave. And there's so many English people in Wales, they swung the vote. And so how did we get to this situation? Well, I want to take you back to the age of the empire. Do you know something called genam, like where you compare two words over the course of a history? I'll put it on the screen, comparing British people and English people. And this is the center crux of the issue. There's this mixture between the two. They don't, there's this confusion between these two labels, English and British. And while Welsh and Scottish, which I'll explain in a minute, can differentiate, England can't because of its history, uh, its political consistency, and its lack of having a voice of its own that's not British. So in the middle of the empire in the 1880s, the word English people was what was being used. And you didn't have British people hardly being used at all. You have this massive blue arc that says English people. And there was no British people was not really a thing when Britain ruled the world, which was actually England. And then not until a Welshman comes along. Just after 1911 and beginning of the First World War, David Lloyd George, Prime Minister, who's from Wales, does he start using the word British people? Because... The Scots and the English were both using Scottish and English people at this time in history. The Welsh had never really lost that sentiment of being British or native British. And they still use the word British a lot. And so he used this, and the government at the time used this, to unify the people as war came in. And especially the Irish War of Independence. They were fearful of something like that happening in Britain. And there was no chance of that happening at the time. It was a groundless fear, but they were still afraid. And so the term English people began to decline and British people superseded it. And you get this spike here in terms of, you get a spike here in using the term British peoples in both of the, the world wars. And that makes sense. You have to be unified against an enemy. But then something strange happens. It progresses similar throughout the rest of the 20th century. And then Tony Blair comes in. And he does something, he does something really exceptionally good. And he makes also two catastrophic mistakes in terms of England. The thing that he does is really good is he recognizes 
that the Welsh and the Scottish are deeply unhappy with the situation. They're not getting governments they vote for, their culture is being marginalised within this British context. The Welsh in the minor strike and the Scots with the poll tax it was an unfair tax that was trialled in Scotland against their will. And so he's very perceptive in identifying, well, I'll offer them devolution and they'll vote for us. And it worked. There, it was part of a significant landslide, other factors as well. But he is very successful in parading being a champion of Welsh and Scottish identity for political prowess and personal gain. Clever guy. But he makes two mistakes in that. He doesn't give the English their own legislative cultural identity in a parliament that's separate from Britishness. And at the same time, he opens Britain further up to the European Union and more immigrants come in. Now this is good. The economy booms, as always happens when immigrants come in. The economy explodes in prosperity. That's what immigrants do. But during the middle of his time, you see here on the graph, the term English people climbs and rises above the term British people being used. And this is because there's a knowledge there somewhere that the Welsh and the Scottish have had their identity recognised, but the English haven't. They have to use the term British, and there's this resentment against that. And that's when this backlash begins building, because he made the mistake of not giving the English devolution to their cultural identity was ignored. And slowly, gremlins come out of their woodworks like Nigel Farage, Aaron Banks, those types of people, and manipulate feeling that they've been ignored by giving other parts of Britain their own identity and giving other countries access to British market. And that's how Brexit slowly builds. But then it doesn't end there. You still have this back and forth because Scotland, why did they, why? If they got their devolution and why weren't they happy with that? Why did they carry on and vote in a, a Scottish National Party government? Well, that's because they still did not get the government at the British level that they voted for. And this is actually a third mistake that Tony Blair did or didn't do. We still have a first-past-the-post system in Britain, which I know America does too, but most other countries have moved well beyond that. I mean, that's just, in the, in the first-past-the-post system, you vote against people, you don't vote for people. Countries like Germany, Netherlands, Ireland, Canada, they've moved on. <laughs> you know, there's a better way of doing it. We still have this old system where it's... It becomes opposition, you know, it's, it's not who you're for, it's who you're against. And that dichotomy of opposition has really been what pulled Scotland further apart. And now that is having a domino effect in Wales. But after that referendum and leading up to it, a lot of people in England felt that fear that, well, during the days of empire, but during the days of empire, they, were, they, they don't know now that they were calling themselves English people, not British. And yet, as the empire was being lost, they were calling themselves British. So there had this psychological effect that they thought that because whilst they were losing the empire, they were calling themselves British, that they always had, and they were losing the British empire rather than losing the English empire. And so they felt, as Scotland nearly voted for independence in 2014, that they were losing their country and their own identity. And this fueled further that backlash. And it's still continuing because we have this populist, English nationalist prime minister who's not even a conservative. I mean, I can understand British conservatism. There's nothing wrong with that. But when it becomes manipulative of English national identity and against Welsh and Scottish national identity, that ceases to be British because British is all of us and respecting each of our national identities. It's not allowing the English identity to become British and supersede the others. 
I'm not necessarily a Welsh nationalist. I can understand it perfectly, and I fully understand at that at the same time that we can have a United Kingdom that works, but not one that's based on English nationalism. That just does not work. And at the moment, that's what's happening. That's what's happening to Britain. English nationalism is the bedrock of the division that we've seen in Scotland, and now it's growing in Wales. And dare I say, English society is beginning to show signs of rupturing within itself because of this English nationalism being seen as British. We really need to go back and cure that and fix those mistakes that Tony Blair made, actually, that the English people need a parliament of their own that is not the British parliament. And we need to resolve our voting system so that all people have an equal voice what they're for, not having to join within wide coalitions, to join with that which what we're against. Because when you can only express what you're against, the house is not going to stand for very long before we tear it down. And that's where the United Kingdom is at the moment. We need to allay the fears of English nationalism and redefine Britishness as not being English identity, but a patchwork of different nations on this island. Thank you very much for watching. I just wanted a short video because I promised myself to get four out on this Easter weekend. We'll see you next time. Thank you.